Okay, okay, I'm recording now. Hey, this is Stefan Kinsella, and you're Alexander Baker. Is that right? That's right. Hi, it's nice to uh, meet you, virtually you meet you. Um, okay, so I just got a little warning from my recorder there. Okay, um, we've never met in person, but uh, we've been chatting a little bit. Why don't you... Um, uh, let me explain the purpose. Uh, you and I have been chatting, and I think you, you and I went back and forth a little bit on IP, and you were kind of anti-IP at first, and then you sort of started veering the other way. But unlike most IP libertarians I've talked to, you actually seem to be honest and sincere about it. So I don't want to sound condescending, but it's maybe you don't agree with me, but I find it hard to find anyone who is not completely anti-IP who is... Um, sincere and honest about this because the arguments are so bad and they're so dishonest, usually. Um, anyway, that's been my experience. I've been working this for 20 years. Why don't you tell people, tell me who you are, what you do, and um, what you're thinking right now about the IP issue. Sure. Uh, my name is Alexander Baker. Um, my day job, so to speak, is I, I write and produce music for a uh, a big multinational uh, entertainment corporation. So I'll I'll lay my my bias uh, if there is one out on the table. I do uh, earn a, a certain amount of my income from exploiting copyrights. So and I think so, you're just so, going to so do I. Yeah, so do I. So I I totally understand that. Yeah. Uh, um. You know, I think that's part of the problem with uh, uh you know perhaps uh, disingenuous uh, arguments or non-arguments on IP. It's just self-interest. I mean, you know, people have, uh, you know, they know where their bread is buttered. So um, Yeah, although most, most people that I've seen argue for IP, they don't really make any money from it. I mean, they're like wannabe novelists or whatever, right? So they have this idea that they're going to be rich someday off of selling music or movies or, or, or books, but they don't, you know, most of them really actually are not, profiting in a financial sense from it in the first place from what I've seen but anyway go ahead sorry didn't mean to interrupt you so anyway so that so I'm um, you know um, I come to that from you know I come to it from from that perspective but I'm also a libertarian um, thanks in large measure to the uh, Mises Institute and their uh, amazing website I've done a lot of study of uh, Austrian economics I'm really interested in in economics and so um, I uh, and of course I'm familiar with your work and some of the other uh, libertarians who've done a lot of work on IP. And uh, at first I um, just sort of accepted the anti-IP argument, mm -hmm. sort of grudgingly, going, "Okay, well, mm -hmm. um, I, I, you know, I guess it it really doesn't exist." But I started doing some work on it myself and just trying to. Um, I thought maybe I could contribute to the conversation and maybe yep. build up the the argument one way or the other just by looking into it. I'm sort of a freelance intellectual, I guess you right. could uh, call me in my a, spare time. A, a gentleman scholar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, what, so, what, state, what state are you in, by the way? Where are you located? Uh, uh, I'm in Southern California. Okay. Okay, cool. So, um, and I started looking into it, and um, I've in working through this come to the conclusion that that IP does exist um, and my my process in doing this was and getting back to what you started out by saying the other thing that I think makes the um, the arguments on, on IP sort of fuzzy and confusing is just the nature of IP I itself of intangible of sort of getting your head around intangible objects is a little bit tricky um, because they're intangible um, and we can't really see it or feel it or touch it uh, the way we can with uh, physical objects and so that's what led me to come up with this concept of intellectual space. Right. Um, intellectual right. space is the, um, it's the title of my uh, my work, uh, a book in the future um, and I've been putting up what I have been writing at uh, my blog which is homesteadip.blogspot.com uh, so the idea of intellectual space is to um, first of all intellectual space is just a, a, a theoretical array of unique locations uh, but then I, I postulate intellectual matter which I would define as that which can be understood through language and that will be analogous to physical matter. 
I uh, define an intellectual object as a bounded pattern of intellectual matter, and that will be analogous to a physical object. And then it, uh, my process is to then try to take the existing uh, theory of property in general, as given by the Austro-Libertarians, Rothbard and Hans Hoppe, uh, and then try to work up the case, the positive case, for intellectual property uh, using the exact same methodology by substituting in these intellectual matter and intellectual objects. And in going through that, I come up with a definition of intellectual property, and it is a non-trivial, homesteaded, rivalrous intellectual object that substantially functions as productive capacity. So that's what I've got as my definition. What do you mean by trivial or non-trivial? Well, um, <clears throat> it would be a, a subjective human assessment as to whether this thing, be it physical or intellectual, is substantial enough, complex enough, uh, big enough to rightly be property. To, to, uh, to, to, be, to be worth protecting. In other words, it's not so... Yeah, I understand. So like in, in a physical situation, if you have two neighbors with l uh, tracts of land that border on each other, they might not worry about whether the, bo the property line is here or here, one inch apart, because it's too, it's too small of a matter to worry about. So they build their houses 10 feet away from the property line just to be sure, right? Just It's a gray area kind of issue. It, 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 exactly. And I mean, it's what I call the, um, the fuzzy boundary problem. Yes. Um, uh, you know, the example when I was talking to, uh, to uh, Stefan Molyneux uh, the other day, you know, he brought up the example, you go into somebody's house and some dust of their dust yes. goes on your clothes yeah. and you walk out. Well, that's, yeah. it's too trivial. Now, yeah, yeah. I, don't, I don't disagree with that approach in terms of things that are clearly defined. For, so, for example, in the left libertarian situation, I've had some left libertarians argue that um, my disagreement, for example, with mutualism, Right, with the idea that if you're not using property, that you can lose it to someone who else, who a cyber squat, I mean a squatter or whatever. Right. They say that, that that's just the, the far extreme of the abandonment notion. And I disagree with that. I think that you could have fuzzy boundaries over what constitutes abandonment. But if you actually own property and you put a boundary around it and you explicitly tell everyone, I'm constantly maintaining this thing, I'm supervising it, I'm checking on it. And I do not abandon it. You can't really say, you can't squeeze that into the abandonment idea. You can't say I'm abandoning it because abandonment is a presumption. It's a default presumption when someone just disappears and you, you have to make a decision at some point about whether what, what happens with the resource. But, but let me back up a second before we go into the details. Um, because you know, if I was to argue with a socialist or a central planner or – a wealth maximizer, it would be different than a libertarian. So l let's see what we agree on. I mean, you're a libertarian, you say, right? Yes. And, I mean, are you an anarchist or just a minarchist, or do you know, or w what do you think about that? Uh, I would call myself an anarcho-capitalist in the Rothbardian, okay. Hans Hoppian okay. tradition. Okay, fine. So you believe in property rights, and so you definitely, you and I agree on this, that if there's a scarce resource out there in the world, that there ought to be property rights in that resource so that people can use the resource productively. You would agree with that, correct? Absolutely, and that is it is this idea of um, scarcity and rivalrousness that, that gives rise to the very need for, for property in general, yeah. So would you agree that if someone proposed a rule that undercut that, that, that would at least be problematic? In other words, if they said, well, I believe that there should be property rights and scarce resources, but... In some cases, we can take the resources away from those people and give it to the poor. I mean, it's just the taking of property. I, absolutely, but I, I would, um, you know, the the first thing that gets uh, problematic is that the the concept of scarcity gets elusive. Um, for example, if you start thinking about manufactured goods, you know. Um, um, you know, are, are pencils scarce? I mean, we're at the point now where we can manufacture plenty enough pencils to satisfy everybody's desire for number two, you know, wooden pencils, you know. Um, and 
I think um, George Reisman in in his book Capitalism does a good job of um, mm -hmm. of getting getting to that about what what scarcity really means. And it really has to do with the unlimited nature of human wants and desires. Correct. That um, you know he he gives the example of well once upon a time scarcity in food means starvation, but Correct. then when you get agriculture, um, it means. Uh, just not enough meat, and then when we produce, start producing meat, it means well, you know, not enough sirloin steak, correct, and and, and so on and so on. So I really prefer, uh, and, and I think you agree, to really focus on rivalrousness, yes. rivalry. Yeah. You know, yeah. is is this thing that we're talking about something that? Um, and of course, that requires a definition. You know, yes. what what do we really mean by rivalrous? Yes. And what what I like to use is pretty simple. It is that um, the use by one person interferes with use yes. by another. I agree with that. I agree okay. with that. So uh, so so given that, um, l l let me ask you this. Um, here, here's how I view it, and you tell me where you disagree or where you think I'm off track. It seems to me that if you have this view of property, then forget about what other things should be property. But we, we agree that there should be property rights, which is ex legally recognized, exclusive rights of control in scarce resources or rivalrous resources, which you, which you said, right? So if there's, a, if there's a particular scarce resource or a rivalrous resource, then we ask the question, who has the right to control this thing? And you and I, I think, would agree that we can decide this question by pointing to some property rules, right? Like we can say, well, who's got the best, who's got the best title to this thing? And we would say it's the guy who first started using it, or it's the guy who purchased it by contract from a previous owner. I mean, do you disagree in general with that sort of approach? No, well, I think uh, property means three things. Uh, it's the right to, to use this thing. Uh, it's the right to transfer ownership to somebody else. Um, and it's the right to exclude others from... Yeah, from in a way, I, I don't know if I agree with you. I actually think it's only the last. I, I don't know if it's the right to use or the right to exclude, or, or sorry, the right to transfer. Um, to me, property means... Um, the right to give permission or to deny permission to others to use this thing. Mm -hmm. That's all. Because the right to a property can't mean the right to use because if it meant the right to use, then you could, you know, shoot your gun at someone else's body. So it's not unlimited, right? So it's not a right to use. But to me, it's just the right to exclude. And that's what patents, by the way, are and copyrights. It's just the, the right to tell someone they can't do something. If you have a patent on a process or an invention, you can't use it. I mean, it doesn't give you the right to use it. Right, I know. It just gives you the right to tell people they can't do this. Right. But you might, you might be infringing someone else's patent by practicing your own patented invention. So, um, I, I, I mean, that's not how I conceive of property. Property is just the right to exclude. You're the person, the actor, with the legally recognized right to have a say-so in who can... Who can Inter, invade the borders of, or use, or inter, interfere with, as you say, this resource. I mean, I think it's the same idea. It's the same idea. I just think that your right to use is not unlimited. Um, it's mainly the right to exclude other people from using this thing. That's why you can say, I can invite you to my house for dinner, or I can say you can't come to my house for dinner. Because I, I own this house, I can say you can't use it. But I can't use my house as a nuclear bomb uh, factory that's going to blow up the neighborhood, right? I mean... Well, of course. I mean, that's just. I mean, that's another way of saying, you know, uh, my property ends where yours begins. I mean, you know, yes. you, you can use your property. It's the right to use, but you know, there's going to be limitations on that depending yes. yeah. on where other people's property rights begin. Yeah. So I totally agree. So the fundamental problem with IP, as I see it, is that it. So, so let, let me set up this example and tell you. You tell me where where we, we diverge. Let's say you and I are neighbors and we want to have a neighborhood where there's no commercial industrial activity and no pig farms and no uh, garish colors on the houses because we all want to live in a neighborhood that's residential and we don't want to reduce our property value, whatever. So mm -hmm. I 
assign to you a property right in my house, which is a restrictive covenant, right, or an easement, which says, I am not permitted, I can use my house for whatever I want to use it for, except my neighbors can veto my use of my house as a pig farm or to have a, a, a purple do, a purple paint color on the house or something like, like, like that. Like a homeowner's association. Kind yeah, of. exactly. Homeowner, okay. Restrictive covenant, that kind of idea. Okay. So there's nothing unlibertarian or wrong about that at all. This is just a contract among people or a property rights assignment among, among people, right? Mm -hmm. But the, the, my point is that unless I'm using my property in a way that in, interferes with your property, you don't have the right to stop me unless I've signed a contract with you. So if I've signed a contract with you, like Restrictive Covenant, where I've given you the right to veto my use of my property as a pig farm, then you don't have the right to stop me from using my property as I see fit, as long as I don't interfere with your property. I mean, would you agree with that as a general libertarian principle? No, absolutely correct. So the problem is, as I see it, Intellectual property is basically what I would call a negative servitude. It basically grants my neighbors or fellow citizens in my community the a veto right over how I use the scarce resources that I have a, a better claim to than they do. So, for example, if you get a patent on a new mouse trap, let's take Rothbard's example, mm -hmm. then the patent would and I know you're not in favor of the statist conception of patent law. We can talk about that in a second. But in any conception you can think of, if you have any kind of property right over the, the method of making the mousetrap or the way the mousetrap is configured, then that really means you can tell me as the owner of my property, I can't use my property in this kind of way. So you have basically a negative servitude like the restrictive covenant or the neighborhood association thing. You can tell me not to use my property in a certain way, but... I never agreed to that, unlike in a restrictive covenant or in a neighborhood where I did agree to it. I never agreed to it, and I never committed a trespass. So by what right do you have to tell me I cannot move around and physically manipulate and engage in transactions? Okay, let's say I want to make a million of these mousetraps and sell them to people. These are bilateral contracts with willing buyers. Mm -hmm. I can't see how, by any of these actions I performed, I've invaded your property. I've not committed a trespass. Now, I know you have this idea of intellectual space, but what have I done to invade what you and I both agree is your property? What gives you the right to veto my activities here? Well, the short answer is, is it is a trespass. Um, you know, in order to say that by by using my intellectual property you have not trespassed you have to assume that there's no property right there which would be just assuming the conclusion well but hold on a second Let, let's who, who do you think the burden of proof is on ah well that i mean that's that's a whole uh, I interesting question the, yeah the, but but i think it's key i think it's key here because this whole thing turns on that i mean who, I, mean, I agree, and and in and in my in my work, I'm I'm trying to do both the the positive case, building up the the positive case for for intellectual property, and also um, criticizing uh, and uh, the the anti IP case. I'm trying to do both. So um, I I I think I would agree that there would be a burden uh, of proof to prove the positive case okay. for IP. If okay. that's what your, if that's, that's what your question is, no, that's, that's fantastic. I think that's and, and then I'll, to, to backtrack just a little bit, um, your example was having to do with patent. And, and let me just interject that, um, I believe that what I'm going to find through my method is that Copyright does exist and is valid intellectual property, but patent is not. Okay, uh, and that I, I know you 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 know this, and you can you can flesh this out. You as a as a patent attorney, uh, but I, I think in general, a copyright is just that. It is the the right to copy some finished work, um, whereas a patent is a has to do with a method of producing something. So in my view, a, a copyrighted work um, 
is it, it's it's a finished work, whereas a patent has to do with a method by which you you might create a, a finished work. Okay. Um, and that's and that's the distinction, and that I think is the key distinction uh, because um, what I find uh, missing uh, in in a lot of these uh, a lot of these debates that I think is absolutely key is to distinguish between consumer goods and producer goods. Okay. And one of the very interesting things about, let's say, a digital media file, we'll use that example. Uh, I write and record a song, and it now exists as a, as a file, a digital media file on my hard drive. And that file uh, can, of course, uh, it can, well, it can do two things. Um, I can listen to it um, for entertainment, and that is its consumer use. But also, I can make copies of that digital media file. Yes, and in that, so that is the. Do you think the that's a good thing? Do you think that's a good thing or a bad thing, just in general? I uh, I don't know that I need to put a value judgment. On it. What what is what good or bad? That people that that they can be copied. Files can be copied easily with with very low cost or no cost. Well, it's it's a, absolutely it's good. Okay. It's goods. No, I mean, and, and you know, I mean, we can go to to Carl Menger's, um, you know, goods character. I definitely, I you know, that's like. No, no, I wasn't talking about economic goods. I just mean, do you, do you actually think it's a good thing or a bad thing? Do you, do you well, approve but that, of but it? That, but that, but that—that's what economic goods are. No, that, economic goods like, are things that have to be economized, right? They have I'm to be sorry. economized. Economic goods have to be economized. That's what. That's why we put economic in front of them. In other words, sure. if you use it, you, you're going to run out of it. You have to decide where you're going to use it. But a recipe or knowledge can be used over and over again. They don't have to be economized. Well, okay. But see, then you need to, you need to look at the general case versus the specific case, like the universal versus the specific. Um, you know, is, uh, you know, aluminum is uh, physical stuff, okay? And it's, okay. A, it's a physical good and it's physical property, Okay. But consider for a second that the supply of aluminum is infinity. We will never, ever run out of aluminum, period. I mean, just to put some numbers on it, the quantity of aluminum in the Earth's crust in measured in tons is a 1 followed by 22 zeros, okay? So it, just to uh, put that in, in perspective, if we, all of humanity, increased our consumption of aluminum by a million fold, okay, and that million times use went on for the next one billion years, at that time we still would have not expended one, one trillionth of the amount of aluminum that we know is there. Well, uh, I, but, but, but I think, okay, so, to, hold on, you have to distinguish whether you're talking about, I mean, it, it, do you have to expend effort to acquire the aluminum? Of, of, of that's the point and and so in in uh, in the the humanly meaningful and of course this is the the point that that Ludwig von Mises takes great pains to point out in in, in his work um, is that what's relevant to humans is our our human connection to it the connection to human action and and I address this in in answering the question are intellectual objects real and um, uh, and, and Mises confronts the problem of whether uh, physical objects are real. Of course, philosophers for centuries have pointed out that um, what we know about physical objects in the physical world really is just through perceptions in our mind, what we see, what we hear, what we can feel and taste and touch. Um, you know, so do, do physical objects really exist or are they just perceptions in our mind? And the way Mises attacks that is in saying, well, we know physical objects are real uh, because they have the power to condition the outcome yes. of human events. I agree with that. Okay, and so, and so, and so do intellectual objects. Okay, so that's, that's how we know they're real. As far as this inexhaustibility... Well, hold, hold on a second. Let's back up. I mean, look, no one can seriously deny that there's a reality, right? I mean... You have to be a realist just to have a discussion. Um, when you say condition the, the, the outcome of actions, I mean, 
knowledge well, plays Mises. Over. Well, that, that's, that's Ludwig von Mises. I'm just, yeah, but you know, I'm just but taking... Me, yeah, but Mises distinguished the role of knowledge and scarce means in action. I mean, would, wouldn't, you, wouldn't you agree with that? I mean, Mises says that you rely on your knowledge to make decisions, but scarce means play a, a causal role in trying to affect the outcome of an action. They're different. That, that, that's right. And so, you know, in trying to decide whether a particular intellectual object is or is not um, ownable as property, I think we have to get to the point where we look at whether or not that intellectual object will function as a productive capacity, as a, as a producer good, um, the way that like a digital media file uh, will. You know, well, but 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 but, 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 but we but, agree already that there should be property rights in scarce resources. That's right. And we agree that scarce resources is a coherent concept, and we, we can agree on, like, my body, my house, my land, my capital equipment. These are all scarce resources, which you agree with me should be owned according to some kind of roughly libertarian Lockean rule. Or do you not agree with that? No, I, I do agree with that, and, and um, that's, you know, I think we have to look at the homesteading principle. I think unowned property becomes initially owned through the homestead principle, which, and I, I think you, my reading of your uh, book tells me that you somewhat disagree with this, but I, I, I'm more in the Lockean tradition of you know, mixing one's labor. No, no, no. I agree, with, I agree with mixing labor. I just don't agree you have to say that labor is owned to, to make that argument. I, I, I don't disagree with the labor uh, metaphor or the labor argument. But you said earlier that you were talking about you disagree with patent, but you agree with copyright. But I cannot imagine you would disagree that copying in general is is some kind of trespass right? no that's that's exactly what it is uh, I mean, and, and oh, no, oh, no, hold on so you think if you copy things it's trespass per se um, I think if you copy a file which um, an original creator no, I didn't say a file let's just talk about normal human activity let's say people interacting in the world and I observe you doing something in the market or in society and I emulate or learn from what you're doing and copy that. Is that trespass to learn? Oh, no, not necessarily, no. So, 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 so I think you would have to agree that the burden of proof is on you to show that what type of copying is a trespass and what type is not because you have, yes, to, you have to admit some, okay. some copying is legitimate. Yes. So what type of copying is wrong and what is, what is not wrong? Okay. And, and why? Okay. Um, I like to use the analogy of, um, I'll use a, a, a song as my intellectual uh, object, and I'll use a bicycle as a physical object okay. and, com and compare the two. And I, I like that because of uh, uh, Nina Paley's song, uh, Copying is Not Theft. She uses that, yep. that bicycle example. Yep. Yep. And, and uh, she said, Copying is Not Theft. Um, uh, you know, and it's true. If you make, uh, you know, if I steal your bicycle, you, you don't have the bicycle anymore. Uh, but if I just copy your bicycle, we, we each have one. So how is copying theft? Well, well, but do you agree with that? Do you agree that if I could look at your bicycle and conjure up a copy, that it wouldn't violate your property rights? Do you well, agree? Well, if you could, by magic? I mean, if you want to talk about magic yeah. and fiction. I, I I don't know I I'm not aware that magic exists so I don't. No, I agree with you, but I mean I'm just saying if if I could examine with an X-ray lens the inside of your body and copy your kidney, let's say your kidney is a really good kidney, and I could manufacture a, a perfect duplicate of your kidney and yeah. insert it in myself to have a kidney, you know, replacement surgery, would that be a violation of your rights? Let's let's use the example of a bicycle because this is something that's okay. in the real world that um, that we actually can can think about. I don't know about a magical kidney reproducing machine, but there really are such things as bicycle factories, and okay. that's how we how we actually copy bicycles. Is that first somebody uh, through capital expenditure builds a factory, and there's an assembly line, and 
once that productive capacity is in place, it becomes uh, much uh, more efficient, much less expensive to crank out copies. Yeah, economy, of, economies of scale, et cetera. Right. right, to make copies of bicycles. So, um, Not copies, but I know what you mean, but they're, they're making new bicycles. They're, 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 they're making new instances of What of they're doing bicycles. is they're taking resources that they own, like metal and plastic and rubber, Right, and they're transforming them into certain new shapes and configurations that have a, a more more valuable use. A more, they're more useful. They're, wealth, to, they're creating wealth. That's right. Um, but before they were able to do that, now you you can um, make a bicycle from scratch without a factory, but it's much more difficult, much more costly, etc. To to do that. And also, so actually, you, so you building, need you need two things. You you need raw materials, and preferably you need like uh, you know uh, an assembly line where you can reduce the economies economies of scale. But you need information too, right? You need all these things for successful action. Would you agree with that? Right, and you need and one, well, you need time, and you need uh, energy. Yeah, you yeah. need time, energy, motivation, lots of things. You need, but you need information or knowledge. And you need the raw materials, right? So now, so I'm not saying that there's necessarily an intellectual property right in the production of a bicycle design. You know, there there maybe, but that would get more into like a patent kind of an idea. And I'm uh, I'm not. That's not what I'm. I'm using that as my example of a physical object, okay. not an intellectual object. Okay, but when I write and record a, a new song, okay. I have, in effect, built a factory. Um, yes, because I agree. I, in effect, you could you could make an analogy. I don't disagree with that. Because somebody, um, you know, somebody out there in the world who who wants to listen to a song, uh, they want to be entertained by a song. They could, if they wanted to, um, write and record their own song, just like they could. Um, if they wanted to, um, you know, build build their own bicycle, um, but it would be uh, a lot easier for a person who just wanted a bicycle uh, to sneak into the bicycle factory uh, at night when nobody was there and run the assembly line and and make their own bicycle off of that existing that existing productive capacity. Yeah, but that, that, was, but, but, that, but, that was, but that would be a trespass that we both agree. It's it seems to me correct. Correct. Exactly. So, so you, that is a trust. But, but we agree on that. So and you're, so when when somebody uses the productive capacity that has been created and therefore homesteaded by somebody else, no, 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 no. They you, are, you, they can't, are you can't say you can't say productive capacity has been homesteaded. That's the problem with your argument. How so? Well, how can productive capacity be homesteaded? Oh, be, because you are, you are transforming previously unowned uh, material into something that is more useful to humans. Yeah, but material, I is think, not, as, material is not a productive capacity. I mean, how do you own a productive capacity? This is this is question I, begging. It seems to me. How, I mean, how does somebody own a factory? By by? No, no. They they own the factory because it's a scarce resource. We both agree on that. We don't disagree. But now you're saying that. The factory is a productive capacity, and is a cap it, is a, it is a capital good. Yeah, That's but right. just just because we agree that you can own a scarce resource, and it happens to be a productive capacity or whatever you want to call it, that doesn't mean that you can own any productive capacity. In other words, it doesn't mean you can own any ingredient that contributes to productiveness, like ideas or information or knowledge. I mean, how does that follow? Well, it, it, it follows because you have to make an assessment as to whether this object, this intellectual object itself, functions completely or, or, or substantially as the productive capacity itself. And in the case of digital media files, they do. With, yeah, you also need you know, a computer, but that's something that basically everybody has by now. And the file itself functions not only as the consumer good for listening for entertainment purposes, but also as a capital good for mass production. So when it's functioning as a capital good, 
it's not like a bicycle, it's like the bicycle factory. And making a copy of that digital media file is like sneaking into the factory and running somebody else's it's, productive it's, capacity. Even it's if It's like, but you say it's like. That's the problem with the art. You say it's like. You're, you're well, using analogies. Correct. My, my, that's, that's exactly right. My entire, my entire piece is an analogy between intellectual objects and physical objects. Let me ask you a question here. Okay. I don't want to interrupt you because I think I know where you're going. But if we had had from the beginning of the world, let's say from early human history, say 100,000 years ago, uh, some kind of copyright, and let's say it lasted forever, okay? So you do realize that right now you and I wouldn't be able to do anything. You wouldn't be able to cook your food. You wouldn't be able to do anything without getting permission from someone else, right? The heirs of the first guy that came up with the idea of cooking food with fire or the first guy that came up with the idea of building a house with a logs and making a log cabin or whatever. So do you realize that if we really implemented this kind of general idea in a broad way with no limits that we would basically all be dead? No, I, I, I don't realize that. I mean, I, I, um, I, um, I would say that, that one could, and in fact, socialists and, and communist types make exactly the same kind of argument for physical property. They say, you know, um, well, 1% of the people are going to own everything. No, 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 I'm not talking about I'm 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 monopolists. I'm saying that if every action you performed could potentially violate the IP rights of millions of people, you would have to get their permission to perform any action. Well, how do you get around that? Well, how do you get around the idea that if one person owned every physical object or, or some small group no, of people not, owned no, no, every I'm, physical object? No, hold on, hold on a second, hold on a second. I'm not it's saying, the same, it's the same I'm not saying, no, I'm not saying one person. I'm saying that there's a dispersed mass of ownership rights. Like the right to cook food over a fire is owned by this group of people. The right to do this is owned by this group of people. So basically every action you want to perform in a modern world, it's prohibited unless you get permission from a million people. Right. It had nothing I, okay. to do with the communist, the argument that. Right, yeah, yeah, okay. No, I, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I don't think, um, uh, you know, I do not support IP rights in, in you know, just raw ideas or in, in methods of doing things. Yeah, but should they, uh, do you think they should expire at a certain time or do you think they should last well, forever or? Um, I, I think if you have to be consistent, I think if it is a property right, um, I think it, it has to be forever. Um, I know. Just that's like, the, just that's like the, physical. Yeah, that's the problem I have with it is people that are consistent are basically advocating the abolition of humanity because – No, come on. No, I'm 100% I'm serious. I don't think we could live. You could not live if you had to get permission for every action you performed. Well, yeah, but I don't agree that that's the result of of a, a rightly understood intellectual property. Okay, Again, so, that, so that gets back to the – so you think – you agree with me earlier, I think, that the burden of proof is on people who propose IP. So – and you're, you're an anarchist. I'm here. So you're an anarchist. You don't believe in the current patent and copyright system. So would you be happy or upset if tomorrow the patent and copyright act were abolished? Uh, gosh, I'd, uh, um, well, and then in, in, in favor of what, I don't know, this is like just, a, just totally this is abolished. like, if, 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 totally you know, abolished. but I'd be happy if Martians, you know, came down no, and, no, and, no, come on, this is a real question. I could say if tomorrow Congress lowered the, the marginal tax rate from 43% to 22%, would you be in favor of that or opposed? I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a it's a coherent question. Oh, okay. So you're you're saying okay. So nothing else changes. Yeah, just that There's one just, thing. All, all of a sudden, um, all of my all of my copyrights, I can't I cannot uh, enforce anymore. Yeah, no, the reason no I'm, asking, I'm not trying to trap you, but I'm trying to I'm trying to get the idea of what, I, whether you I, believe that the current patent and copyright system or some kind of rough rough simulation of what you think would be put in place by a contractual or private property system. Or whether you think you have some other idea in mind, I'm just trying to get an idea of what you are in favor of. Right. So um, would I'm, you be okay. would you be in favor of abolishing patent and copyright or not? 
Uh, I favor the free society. Um, yeah, and I believe that on a, on a free society, there would be intellectual property rights, as I've described. Well, only, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's back up. But let's take it one step at a time. Would you be in favor of the federal government abolishing patent and copyright tomorrow? Um, I, I, I don't mean to try to avoid your question. I just, you know. That's okay. If you don't know, everything just else, okay. I, just want know, I just want to understand it so that I can be. That's fine. You know, That's fine. Um, so you're saying everything else is the same. All they do is they're they abolishing. Re they repeal the, the, the patent and copyright statutes. Um, would I be in favor of it? Would you uh, be happy or sad? I mean, I don't know how to put it. I mean, would you be pro or con? Um, well, I mean, from a, a purely self-interested point of view. No, uh, but a, as an anarchist or as a libertarian. Right. Gosh, I, I mean, we would still be so far from anything resembling, uh, you know, free world. Well, but why? Because you believe that in a private society, we, we could emulate some aspects of copyright by some kind of contract system or whatever. And we do have contract law right now, so why couldn't people just have negotiations and just do whatever you think they would do in a private society anyway. I mean, I don't understand what the big uh, objection to abolishing patent and copyright would be for an anarchist IP. Uh, uh, okay, okay. Um, yeah, the, the short answer is that you that a concept of property has to pre-exist contract. I, uh, I agree, of course. Well, in one sense. On the other sense, the contract, the, the concept of agreement is the antecedent of property, right? Because property arises when civilized people come together and they agree with each other in a sense to live and let live, right? And re like, I'm going to respect what you do, you respect what I do, and we're going to cooperate with each other, live in a society with division of labor. So in a way, agreement, which is a proxy for copyright, I mean for contract, agreement is the antecedent for property. But I agree that property and contract and agreement all go together. Well, they not only go together, but but one half. You know, it's like uh, you know Pierre Proudhon's you know uh, famous uh, socialist maxim: "Property is theft." Yes. And and the the criticism of that is to say, well, theft is completely meaningless. Yes. Absent a concept of property, and so property. They not only go together, but property has to come first. I, I totally agree. I do think. Okay. I think. The, and, I think. The, the I will say though, the um, sorry. Go ahead. I will say the exact same thing about contract. Um, contract is simply a, a promise or a set of promises that the law will enforce a, as a as a duty. Um, and there will be law in a free society. Uh, there'll be free market law. Yes, I agree. And with that. and but. One can only contract with that which is property. You know, I can sell you my car, but I can't sell you that car because I don't own that car. Yes, but uh, but, but you and I agree. We are, we already agree that scarce resources should be protected by property rights. So the question is, should non-scarce resources be protected by property rights? No, and again, I prefer I prefer to use the term rivalrous. Um, but I, I, and that's part of you know my definition: intellectual property, non-trivial, homesteaded, rivalrous intellectual object that substantially functions as productive capacity. So I think that pretty much rules out patent stuff. So, it, so wait, hold on a second. So are you saying that you don't have a property right in something unless you can show that it's got some kind of productive capacity? Is that a condition of having property rights in some resource? You, I'm sorry. Well, are, you, you mentioned no, this. no. It, it wouldn't no. It wouldn't necessarily apply to to any resource, but that is the way to show that it is a a, a separate object than the consumer object. Okay, I, I, I don't know what, what's what's an object and what's the relevance of something being an object. Um. <clears throat> I'm not sure if I'm not sure if I understand your your question. Well, you're, but, you're mentioning it being an object, right? As if that's a relevant thing to mention. So, what's the relevance of it? Well, of demarcating that, something as an object. 
to not. show that it to show that it exists. To okay, so what does that mean? From, the, from first but, principles. But, but earlier you were saying the property didn't even exist, like scarce bodies. Or, I mean. It seems to why me is, okay. Yeah, why is it rivalrous? That's uh, what you're getting at. Yeah, okay. But, but 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 really, there's. Do you really think there's a big dispute? Do you think that there's a dispute at all about whether an idea or a pattern of information is rivalrous? I mean, do, do you believe? Are you saying that the recipe to build a house in a certain way is rivalrous? Are you saying that information? Yeah, I don't think I don't think so. But the 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 the, the test. Is going to be the test does for what? that in, huh? the test for what the test for whether it's uh, rightly property um, is going to come down to is it rivalrous and here's here's how I attack that okay wait so you just dis- you agree or you disagree with that so you uh, think, I you, think, think rivalrous, re- you think you think non rivalrous things can be property or should be property I think a recipe most likely is not rivalrous but let me let me just get no at- but do you think it should be property. If it's not rivalrous, it cannot be property. But here, here's what we have to do to try to get at that. We have to define rivalrous. And we agreed it means use by one interferes with use by another. Yes. But then, then we have to, when we're looking at some particular intellectual object, we have to ask, what is its use? Give me an, exam- it- give me an example of an intellectual object that you're talking about that you think there's a property right in that's not rivalrous or that should be reclassified as rivalrous. I'm, I'm kind of I'm confused on... Are you saying that anything... that only things that are rivalrous should have property rights in them? But Correct. that some things that are now called IP ought to be viewed as rivalrous. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay, and so some not. Give, give me an example, the clearest example you can think of, of an ideal, which is what Tom Palmer calls it, an ideal object. Mm-hmm. Which is rivalrous, although most, well, I would say every economist on the face of the earth would say is not rivalrous. So, give me an example of a actually rivalrous pattern or recipe or right a a a, a an original song that exists as a a digital media file. Okay, a song. Okay, sure. So the song is rivalrous. Why? It's rivalrous because its use, okay, not the consumer use, but the capital goods use of that digital media file is to mass produce copies and to exploit a scarce and limited supply but why do you, of, why do you, of why potential do you, customers. Why do you say that's its use? You're just stating that like it's, like it's uncontroversial. Uh, okay, yeah. I mean, wait, hold on, hold on. Could, the, could, could, I'll answer, that's could, a great could, question. Couldn't I say, um, if I had a monopoly to produce playing cards in England in 1612, that that monopoly right is a, is a rivalrous resource because so long as people respect it, I can sell playing cards at a monopoly price and make a lot of money. So, I've, and, and couldn't I say that someone who has a Medicare or Social Security payment or income or a veteran's welfare, not veterans uh, pension or whatever, don't they have a stream of income that they value? I mean, so what? I don't understand why a government grant of some income stream or protection from competition that you can profit from means that there's a property right in that, which is what it seems to me all you're saying. No, 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 no. Uh, it's not. No, come on. That's not what I'm saying. It, I'm simply saying that you, you, in order to decide whether something is or is not rivalrous, you have to start with the definition of what rivalrous is, which is something that I do include in my book. It's something I actually, frankly, found not in in, in your book, okay. uh, which was. Um, but in its use by one interferes with use by another. So obviously, then the next question you have to ask is. What is the use? And I think one of the um, the big contributions of Austrian economics is to understand that all valuation is subjective, and and that's what we're talking that's about. Fine. You know, when I, something I, is useful, fine. hang hang on, okay? No, no, I'm I'm, I'm just saying I agree. I'm agreeing. Go ahead. Um, when when something is useful, when something is valuable, it means it's useful. That's really the the same thing. 
usefulness is is value. And what what I value and find useful might very well be different than what you value and what you find useful. And so when you have, uh, say, a song that I created, that I wrote, and that I recorded, um, and I find it useful, uh, you have to, you know, uh, you know, the consumers out there might find it useful for entertainment purposes, but that's not why I find this digital media file useful. I find it useful because I can use it to mass produce new copies of that and sell them. O um, only if and, there's copyright and, law. Wait, and, and, only and if there's copyright let me, law. Let me, Stefan, let me finish my sentence, okay? Please, okay? That's how I find it useful. And it's clear to me that somebody copying interferes with that use. So now you and I have agreed that the definition of rivalrous is interferes with use. So now I, I, I think it's pretty clear yeah, that somebody you, copying, and, and if they're going to try to then commercially exploit another copy of that digital media file, that's going to interfere with my use, and therefore it is rivalrous. And that's why you have to look at whether this object does or does not substantially function as a productive capacity. That's going to be the key. The key is understanding the difference between uh, producer use and consumer use between uh, producer or capital goods and, and consumer goods um, because you know it, and if this intellectual object is functioning as a capital good then you can say that the person who created it homesteaded that capital productive capacity into existence and because it was an act of homesteading it's rightfully owned so okay. that that's how I approach it do, do you see um, do you see the need to um, further define this and to limit the boundaries of what you're talking about because otherwise do you see the danger of this spinning out of control and ensnaring the world in a net of, of limits that no one could use their property for anything or do you, do you see <laughs> Absolutely, um, okay. and I, I do, and, and and the exact same problem arises with physical property. No, you it know, doesn't. Uh, it doesn't. For, the exact same, same problem does not arise. But go ahead. Go sure. Ahead. No. Well, I'll tell, I'm sure, of course it could. You know, somebody um, finds a, 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 a previously unowned a patch of land and stands there and says, um, "I hereby homestead." As far as my eyes can see in all directions, this is now my property. But that's now, not the libertarian view. The libertarian view is that you get to homestead the actual scarce resource, which is a real scarce means used in human action, to the extent you actually use it. And you can show evidence of that by mixing your labor with it or putting up borders that show people the ex exact borders and extent of the boundaries of your property. I, I, I don't see the, well, the analogy at it's all. So I mean, you know, I, I think I, I'm more inclined to to favor the actual use of That's rather fine. than, you know, because I don't know that building a fence necessarily is enough. I mean, somebody could no, imagine. No, I agree. The fence imagine is a proxy somebody, for imagine, use. Imagine I agree. somebody builds a, uh, a 10 foot square fence, right, in some area, and he says, I've just put a fence around my land. But it's not, it's actually not the fence. Uh, what you think is inside, I've actually fenced inside the entire rest of the earth yes. on the other side, on yes. the outside of that fence. Yeah, I agree with okay. you. I agree with and, you. And then that. there's there, there's all kinds of other things. Look, if but I it's a, it's a practical thing. You're actually using a resource in a way that the society around you recognizes is a use of this resource which human beings use for certain purposes in the real world, right? Okay. I mean, we're, so the dispute is always over a scarce resource. Right. And it seems so, to me you're setting up a – I mean, would you at least agree – I mean, you've already agreed the burden proof is on you. I mean, let me ask you a question. How certain are you in your mind that you could work – you could make some legitimate theory out of your IP, your proto I – mean, and, and you're not talking about patent and copyright as they exist today, although you seem hesitant to advocate the repeal of patent and copyright. So I have to think there's some similarity. So I, I don't really know – whether you're really in favor of patent and copyright being abolished and whether there's a similarity and whether what you're advocating is something totally different. I mean, wh what do you think is your burden of proof of clarifying what you're advocating and how different it is from the current IP system or, or what? 
Well, yeah, I, um, I think I'm, I'm gaining confidence as I go forward. Um, again, my, my approach in the beginning was to first restate the existing case for property rights as given by the Austro-Libertarians, okay. by Mises and Rothbard and, and Hans Hoppe in Theory of Capitalism and Socialism, um, which you cite in your book, and I, which I think is right on. Then to postulate my intellectual space matter objects, then to build up the case for intellectual property uh, using exactly the same logic as the case for physical property, just simply substituting in intellectual matter for physical matter, intellectual objects for physical objects, um, and, and so on. And I, I've done that, and I've really, there's a table that you can find on my blog, which is homesteadip.blogspot.com. Uh, there's a table where I do a side-by-side -side comparison of uh, a song as my intellectual object and a bicycle as a physical object, and I take it from the point where it doesn't exist at all to bringing it into existence to, you know, what is the consumer use, what's the, what's the capital good, uh, what is the effect of copying this object, what, you know, and, and side by side by side, step by step by step, I just don't find a difference. And I, I got into this thinking that I would find right. these huge differences, right. but, I, but I just don't. So no, no, and, and I'll be honest, you're the only guy I've ever talked to who, anyway, you know what I'm saying. You're the only guy I've talked to who I don't agree with on this who is not <laughs> insane. <laughs> I mean, I, I think you're, I think you're searching honestly. Um, let me ask you a couple questions. Fine. Sure. I think we need to cut it off in a couple minutes. But okay. if, if you believed there was a conflict between the kind of common sense libertarian property rights and scarce resources that we, I think, all believe in and these IP ideas, would you – would you give the IP up, or do you think that the other is more primary? That's one question I have for you. Um, okay. So let me well, see what you let say. Me, there. Let me just take one me. question. Yeah, um, so, um, you know, you're. I think you're asking whether you know intellectual property imposes. You know, the class. You know, imposes restrictions on physical property. Yes. You know, yes. I, I write a book. I say you cannot copy it. Yes. Well, you know, who am I to tell you you can't use exactly. your own physical body, your own pen, and your own paper and your own ink? Um, and but I would simply point out that physical property has exactly the same kind of restrictions on it. Okay, you own a gun, you own bullets. You're not allowed to shoot me, even though it's your body pulling the trigger and it's your bullet. Yeah, and but, it's your but okay. Gun. So, so th th this is a. Um... This is an argument that I get all the time, and it it kind of drives me nuts because, so what you're what you're saying is that because property rights are limited, sometimes any limit is okay. That's how it no. seems to me. No. So, but no. but then what's the relevance of the fact that I can't? I mean, the reason I can't shoot my gun at your head is because you have a property right in your head. Right. So, in other right. words, you're using the primacy of property rights in physical property. To argue that property rights are not, are not uh, absolute or something like that. I mean, I don't even understand what that argument is supposed to prove. I mean, you know, okay, well, you, what know, you that, could you could murder someone. Argument, you could say you could what say that look, argument I'm, is. Go ahead. What that argument is supposed to prove is that intellectual property behaves just like physical property in a in a praxeological but that's analysis. Not you could say that slavery behaves like regular property. I own a property right in this slave. I can sell him. It behaves like it. So the hell what? That's not the question. The question is whether an, a given action is justified or not. And if you and I both assume that people have property rights in their bodies and in things that they acquire by contract or that they appropriate from the unknown state of nature, then if someone else can tell me I can't use it in a certain way, then they have to have a good reason for that. They have to either have be the first owner of it, they have to have bought it from me by contract, or have a contract with me, or I have to be using my property in a way that invades their property, right? But in the case of IP, none of that's happening. I am just manufacturing a new car, let's say, that looks like your car, or a new mousetrap, or I'm making a novel, I'm printing copies of a novel, how is that invading your physical property rights that we agree on? You, I think you agree that it's not. You, what you're saying is that it, it, it invades your uh, 
this opportunity space kind of thing. This idea that you have the... I mean, I honestly don't... I think... I, I, I don't think you would disagree. You would have to define this a lot more clearly to set up some kind of private property rights scheme in this idea space idea you have, right? I mean, and I actually don't understand it because I understand IP, and I don't know whether your I, your conception of IP, private IP, whatever you want to call it, is broader or narrower or more restrictive or less restrictive than the current IP system. Does it, it apparently lasts forever, unlike current IP, and apparently it would cover things more than IP. I mean, IP doesn't cover food recipes or uh, fashion designs right now or database rights or maps. I don't know if yours would cover that or not. I don't know what the general principle is. It seems, it seems to me that if you make a general principle out of what you're talking about, you're going to choke off all human life and productivity because you're going to say every idea we come up with that is useful in some capital good sense, then someone has a proprietary right in it, which means they have the right to stop other people from using it unless they get permission, which means everyone's got to get permission from everyone all the time for billions and billions of actions they're going to perform in their life. And so that means you could never even ask permission because that might be copyrighted or whatever you want to call it. So I just think human life would die out. I, I, I just see nothing wrong with observing. I mean, let me ask you a simple question. Let's say on, on your version of the free market, there's competition. And you see a guy make a new mousetrap, which has an improvement. Can you make a similar mousetrap and compete with him, or do you think that's a violation of his property rights? Um, I, I I do not think it's a violation of his copy co uh, copyright. I mean, a, a mousetrap is a is a physical object. There's an intellectual design component to it, and in the current uh, patent law, maybe somebody has a patent and that might interfere with that. But under my uh, conception, the intellectual component itself is like a recipe or a plan for how to build a, a better mousetrap, but that recipe itself does not substantially function as a productive capacity. Why not? Itself. Why doesn't it? Why, why do you say it doesn't? Because you still need pieces of wood and metal and unobtainium and whatever is in this, in this recipe. You can't simply take the intellectual stuff, duplicate that, and sell that to consumers. Okay, so, so, consumers so in the, in, in, they want in, the better mousetrap. So, in the pre-internet age, you would say the same thing about a song because a song had to be put on pieces of paper, etc. Nowadays, it's digital. So right. you're saying intellectual property should not exist except in the digital age. Is that kind of what you're saying? Uh, no, I mean that's kind of getting to what I'm getting okay. at. But no, I think I think there was a, a copyright pre-digital. Um, you know, yes, you know, to physically copy a book, you need ink and paper and so forth. But I think you could still say that the intellectual content substantially functions as a productive capacity. Okay. Um, and again, okay. I, I fully uh, agree that, that, that drawing these lines as to what is substantial and what is not is arbitrary and subjective. I, I grant that, but I would just simply point out that physical property has exactly the same kinds of subjective, arbitrary um, boundary issues that have to that have to be drawn. Yeah, so I, 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 that's just. I hear what you're saying. I, I do think personally there's a difference between the. Uh, the unavoidability of gray areas, right? Like, say, between tracts of land or between gray areas of, of... There's a clear area here, there's a clear area here. In between, it's gray. I think mm -hmm. that's unavoidable. That's not the same thing as subjective and especially arbitrary. And the, 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 pa the patent... So, because you and I both agree there should be a patent, a property right in this tract of land, and there should be one here. And so then it's necessarily the case that there's a border between them. The problem with, let's say, Ayn Rand's argument for some patent term that's somewhere between infinity and zero. Say she just assumes it should be a, a finite number between zero and infinity. And she says, well, and I agree with her. If you assume that the patent term or the copyright term should be more than zero and less than infinity, then you've got to pick some number in the middle. And it's kind of like the gray area situation of the property borders we talked about earlier. But that requires assuming that zero 
is not as good as some finite number. And I would say it's, it's not a, a Gaussian curve where the, some, some peak in the middle we're trying to reach the peak. I think it's a, a monotonically decreasing curve where the more you have, the worse it gets. And the optimum is at zero. Maybe it's this way. I don't know. But So anyway, that's a different issue. But um, I think we should kind of cut it off now. I think I've let you have your say. And I respect your opinion. I think you should keep working on it and thinking about it. And I will too. And if you want to give any kind of final, you shouted out your website a couple times. Um, and I think we should keep dialoguing on this because I think you're an honest and uh, uh, sincere thinker on this issue, which is very rare. And I hate to be condescending again, but very rare from your side. Um, so go ahead. Have your final say. I, I, and we'll I, I, I really appreciate it. Yeah, again, it's homesteadip.blogspot.com. Uh, I, uh, you know, back at you. You know, I really appreciate the opportunity to, uh, you know, to, to come on and dialogue with you. I, I absolutely agree that if IP is property, then it is property, and if it's not, then it's not. And and any of this, well, yeah, but it should only last for 17 years. And all of that, I agree, is just fuzzy and muddled and 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 so forth. So I I will continue working on this and. Um, and uh, I, again, I really appreciate the opportunity to come on with you, Stefan. Thank you very Good. much. Like talking to you too. We'll chat later, okay? All right. Bye bye. Bye bye.